Hey, well, turn with me to Mark's Gospel. Don't turn anywhere particular. Maybe just turn to the front of it because we'll be flicking through um, quite a lot of passages as we kind of recap this, this Gospel that we've been going through. So last week, if you didn't know it, we actually finished Mark's Gospel. And so what I wanted to... I heard today some cheers. You know, I remind you that COVID has played a big part in, in how long it's taken to get through it. But last week you finished Mark's Gospel. So what I wanted to do was spend some time just summarizing its message for you. Now, if you've turned in your Bibles, some of you may question that there's an extra 12 verses in your Bibles. And it probably has a little footnote. It's probably bracketed with a little footnote on the side explaining why they're there. And just to quickly recap, most if not all textual scholars believe that these verses were added by some scribes a little later on. It's kind of a patchwork of summarizing texts taken from the Gospels and from the book of Acts, and they've added in there because Mark ends so abruptly, right? Um, but that's how Mark, it's classic of Mark, you know, just uh, everything's fast-paced, immediate, the Christ is risen, and then the, the, the ladies are fleeing with fear and trembling and awe and amazement as we see how people responded to Christ all throughout his Gospel. Um, but a lot of scholars believe this because, one, it doesn't follow the style of Mark throughout Mark's gospel, but also the earlier Greek manuscripts don't have those verses uh, in those copies. So, listen, if you want to talk with me more about that, I'm happy to talk with you after the service. But what I did want to do was just give some more time into thinking how we can continually use Mark in our own lives for our own sanctification, but also in the lives of others. How can we use Mark in sharing it with our children, with our family, with our friends, with our neighbors as we call them to follow the Lord Jesus Christ? So remember, listening to sermons isn't just for your own personal edification. It's not just for your own benefit. It's also to help you be able to explain God's truth to others as you have had it explained to you. This is a part of being a faithful steward of God's truth, right? Paul said to Timothy, Timothy, grab faithful men and trust the truth to them who will also be faithful and trusted to others and so on and so on and so on. As parents, those who are parents, we've all had parents. Uh, some of us are still parents. As parents, we're entrusted with passing the truth on to our children, explaining to them who Christ is, who God is. How, how are we saved? Why do we need to be saved? It's also a key ingredient in what? The Great Commission, right? Jesus said, go and teach them not just what I've taught, but to obey all that I've commanded. And so as we listen to the Word of God, we're not just listening for ourselves, but we're listening to say, okay, how can I then explain that to other people as I've had it explained to me? So with that in mind, we're going to summarize Mark's gospel message, his evangelical message under four headings. Who is Jesus Christ? What did he come to do? How did people respond to Jesus, and then what is your response to Jesus? And so think of this as kind of an evangelical kind of gospel message outline that you might share with others. So here's the first one. Who is Jesus Christ? Right At the centerpiece, remember, of Mark's gospel, Jesus asked his disciples this really important question. Do you remember what it is? Who do you think I am? Who do you say that I am? Right. This is the central issue of Mark's gospel which he makes clear from the very opening verse. Right here he says, Mark 1.1, 1, 1, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. The gospel is about Jesus Christ, who he is and what he has done. And Mark expands on this throughout the whole of his book. When you listen to Paul talking to the Romans in Romans 1.1, 1, 1, he says to them that he's an apostle set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets and holy scriptures concerning who? Concerning Christ. The gospel of God concerns Jesus Christ. In 1 Corinthians 1.23, remember, Paul said that he preached Jesus Christ and him crucified, who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. The gospel is about Jesus Christ. It is about getting the person of Christ right. And this is essential to salvation, right? So when you're sharing the gospel with someone, you're telling them about who Jesus Christ is. You're asking them, who do you say Jesus is? And you're going from there. And that's kind of great because then you get to hear what they have to say. Some people might say, oh, Jesus is just a mythical figure. He never really existed. Well, then you start from there. 
People might say, well, Jesus is a good man, but that's all that he was. Well, then you go from there. And you're instructing them on who Jesus Christ is. Mark tells us that Jesus is the Son of God. You see that there in verse 1 1. This is acknowledged by God the Father at Jesus' baptism, remember? And then when Jesus was transfigured, it's acknowledged by the demons. Listen, remember, James says even the demons believe. They tremble. They don't have salvation, but they know who Jesus Christ is. They know who God is. It was acknowledged by the Roman centurion at the end of Mark's gospel when he saw the way Christ died. He said, surely this is the Son of God. And it was acknowledged by Christ himself when he was questioned by the Sanhedrin. And this title, the Son of God, speaks not only of Jesus' unique relationship with God, the Father, but of his own divine nature, that Jesus is God. And he demonstrated this with his authority to forgive sins. This is a prerogative that only God can have. Only God can forgive sins so that there is no eternal consequences to it. I mean, you and I can forgive one another of, our, of sins committed against us, right? Which means we don't hold it against you. If I forgive you of a sin or you forgive me of a sin that I may have committed to you, I seek forgiveness and you forgive me, it means you no longer hold that sin against me. You don't treat me in regard to that sin. But you can't deal with the eternal consequences of sin. Only God can do that. Only God can forgive that. And here Jesus is saying that he has the authority to do that. We also see Jesus' deity in his commanding of nature when he stilled the storm, when he told the waves to stop and that the wind to stop blowing. Who else can command nature except the one who created it? Right? Jesus Christ through whom all things were made. We also see that Jesus is able to restore life. He raised up Jairus' 12-year-old daughter. She was dead and he gave her life again. Who else, can, who else commands life and death except who? God. And so we see then Mark shows that Jesus is the Son of God. Secondly, he says Jesus is the Son of Man. And this is Jesus' favorite title for himself. He uses it nine times when he spoke of his own death and sufferings. Three times when he spoke of his future return in glory and then two other times he used it when he talked about the authority that he has to forgive sin and to rule over the Sabbath, right? Which is, again, another indication that Jesus is God because whose Sabbath is it? It's the Lord's Sabbath. And Jesus said, yet I am the Lord over the Sabbath. When Jesus had a, um, while Jesus had a human nature, the title, the Son of Man, set him apart from the rest of humanity. Because while he is a man, he's not just any man. He is the one alluded to in Daniel seven thirteen to 14 who has given dominion and glory and a kingdom and that all the peoples of the nations and of men of every tribe and tongue and language are to serve him. That is who he is. Thirdly, Mark says that Jesus is the Christ. He is the Christ. This was the answer that the disciples gave to him when Jesus asked, who do you say that I am? Matthew said, you are the Christ. This means anointed one. It's a title given to those whom God appointed as kings over Israel to rule his people. And it then came to refer to that future uh, descendant of King David who would deliver his people from their enemies. He would deliver their people from their sins. And he would not only rule over the nation of Israel, but over the whole world as we saw in Daniel 7, 13 to 14. He has given dominion over all. But by Jesus' day, the majority of people thought of the coming Christ as just a political figure, as a military figure. And so oftentimes you would see in other gospels, they wanted to take Jesus away and make him king. But Jesus didn't want to do that. God would do that in time. And so what they saw, the Christ is just being this human king endowed with power by God, special gifts that, that set him apart. But Jesus pointed out to the people that the Christ was more than that, that he was more than that. And so if you look at Mark chapter 12, in verse 35, It says, Jesus began to say, as he taught in the temple, how is it that the scribes say that the Christ is the son of David, i.e. that he is a man, descendant from King David? When David himself said in the Holy Spirit, 
The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I put your enemies beneath your feet. David himself calls him Lord. So in what sense is he his son? So Jesus is pointing out that even David acknowledges that this one, this future son of David, sitting at the right hand of the Father, is greater than him. And so Jesus is alluding here to the fact that the Christ is not just the Son of Man, but he is the Son of God. That he is God. As John would say, the pre-existent one who then came into the world becoming a man and was given the name Jesus Christ. That he is God incarnate. That's how he is greater than David. And then we see then all these titles applied to Jesus in this one section in, in Mark chapter 14. Look there with me. In verse 61, when he's been questioned by the Sanhedrin, the high priest said, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? And remember, the, the Blessed One was just a, a replacement for the name of God because many Jews wouldn't say the name God. But he says, Are you the Christ, the Son of the Blessed One? And Jesus said, I am. And you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming with the clouds of heaven. And so as you think over what Mark has communicated to us about Jesus Christ, is this your understanding of who Jesus Christ is? Do you see him as the Son of God, the Son of Man, the Christ, God incarnate? This is the understanding that you need to give to others when you're telling them about Jesus Christ. Because remember, their salvation and your salvation hinges upon believing in the right Jesus. The one the Gospels proclaim, the one the Apostles proclaimed. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the Son of Man. So that's who Jesus is. That's who Mark tells us Jesus is. And that's how you want to tell other people about Jesus Christ. Your children, your friends, your neighbors, your workmates, everyone that you come in contact with. So then what did Jesus come to do? That's the second question we want to ask. What did Jesus come to do? Well, Firstly, Mark tells us that Jesus came to preach the gospel of God. Look again in Mark chapter 1. In verse 14, it says, After John had been taken into custody, Jesus came into Galilee preaching the gospel of God. And look at verse 38 of the same chapter. Jesus said, Let us go elsewhere to the towns nearby so that I may preach there also, for that is, why, that is what I came for, to preach the good news which is about Jesus Christ. Remember, the gospel is about the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God. He is the King through whom the kingdom has drawn near. Uh, in verse 14 of chapter 1, Jesus said, um, sorry, in verse 15, the time is fulfilled, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. And so Jesus is the King of that kingdom. And that the kingdom had drawn near because Jesus Christ was present. And his kingdom authority was seen in the things that he said and in the exercise of his power and, and healing demons and exercising it over nature and over all of creation. But the kingdom didn't come in fully. Why? Because the people ended up rejecting the king. And so firstly, Jesus came to preach the gospel of God. Second, Jesus came to call people to follow him. Jesus came to call people to follow him. You see that uh, with Simon and Andrew in verses 16 to 18. Jesus called them to follow him. Likewise with James and John, he called them to follow him. And then the son of Levi, uh, Levi the son of Alphaeus, who was also called Matthew, the tax collector. Remember sitting there at the booth collecting taxes and Jesus called him to follow him. And then look with me in Mark chapter 8, verse 34, after that central point in Mark's gospel where he asks his disciples who he is, and they say to him, you are the Christ. And then Jesus summoned the crowd with his disciples and said to them, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and what? Follow me. This is a general call to all and any to follow him. 
For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For everyone who is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the power of his Father and with the holy angels. And so Mark, to Mark tells us that Jesus came to call us to follow him. It's a call to sinners. Remember, in, in Mark chapter 2, verse 17, Jesus said that it's not those who are healthy who need a physician, but those who are sick. I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. And so therefore, because it's a call to sinners, it's then a call to repentance from sin and faith in Jesus Christ. Again, Mark 1.15, where Jesus says, The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Repentance and faith, you remember, they go hand in hand. They're the two sides of the one coin. One does not come without the other. Nor are they one-time acts never to be repeated again. Right? The commands here are present tense, meaning that you're often repenting of your sin. You're constantly believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's an indication of, of your salvation, that you are saved. This is the mark of a Christian, that he continually repents of sin. He continually believes in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, you know, the moment that you first repented of your sin, when you realized who Christ was, when you realized what he had done for you on the cross and dying for your sin, that first time when it dawned in you, the Spirit of God opened your heart to know and understand the truth, and you repented of your sin and you believed in Jesus Christ, you were saved. At that moment, you put your trust in Christ, you were justified before God. You were declared righteous in his sight. He would brought you through Christ into a right relationship with him. But along with that declaration of God concerning you, there was a change in your nature. You became a partaker of God's divine nature, being indwelt by the Holy Spirit. You received new life. And this new life is evident in an ongoing repentance from sin and an ongoing trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so as you grow in your faith, as you grow to know the Lord more and more and more, as you continually increase in, in your call and His call to follow Him, you become more sensitive to sin. You become more aware of your need of daily dependence on Christ. And so when that happens, you, you repent and you trust the Savior. You trust that He's forgiven you for that sin, that He'll give you the wisdom and the grace and the strength to continue to obey Him and to follow Him through life. And so Jesus came to preach the gospel. Jesus came to call sinners to follow him. And we see here that Jesus came to give his life as a ransom. This is how we can be forgiven. Again, look with me in Mark chapter 10, verse 45. Jesus said, For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Jesus gave his life as the payment to release us from the bondage of sin and death. That's what Jesus did. Because our problem with human beings is our sinfulness, that we are sinners. And Jesus makes that really clear in Mark chapter 7 and 21. Look with me there. When Jesus is talking about defilement, he says, From within, out of the heart of men, proceed evil thoughts, fornications, thefts, murders, adulteries, deeds of coveting and wickedness, as well as deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride and foolishness. All these evil things proceed from within and defile the man. And the heart in Scripture, you remember, is, is the totality of your being. 
It's not just your physical body, but it's your mind, it's your thinking, it's your affections, it's your will acting. And because of our sinfulness, we're under the judgment of God, we're we're liable for eternal condemnation. And just as a side note, parents, this is the goal of your parenting, it's to reach the heart of your children. Because your children's selfishness or disobedience, whatever they may show on the outside, comes from the heart and so you want to reach their heart why are they being selfish or why are they being angry or why are they being disobedient to you you want to reach the heart because that's where the source of the disobedience is coming from and you want to tell them ultimately that sin is the problem and that Jesus Christ came to deal with the sin so coming back to Christ paying a ransom Romans 3.24 says that we are justified through that redemption. Colossians 1.14 says that we are forgiven of our sins through the redemption of Jesus Christ. The reason why Christ can call us to follow him is because he has made it possible for us to be forgiven of our sins, to be reconciled to God, and to follow Jesus Christ. I love what the Apostle Peter, remember who was the source of Mark's material, He says this in in 1 Peter 1.18. You were not redeemed with perishable things like silver or gold from your futile way of life inherited from your forefathers, but with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished and spotless, the blood of Christ. And so Jesus came to offer his life as a ransom for sin. Thirdly, How do people respond to Jesus? We've seen who Jesus is. He's the Son of God, the Son of Man, the Christ. We see what he came to do to preach the gospel of God, to call sinners to follow him, and to lay his life down as a ransom so that he can make that possible for sinners. But how do people respond to Jesus? Throughout Mark's gospel, you may recall, you read about the large crowds following Christ, right? So much that at times he couldn't even eat in his own house. At times he couldn't even publicly go into a city. Rather, he had to be on the outskirts of a city in the unpopulated places so that the population might come to him and hear him speak and preach and teach. And then the crowds that did follow Jesus were constantly amazed at the things that Jesus said and things that he did, the amazing miracles that they saw. And not wanting to be irreverent, but... It could almost have been like the greatest show on earth. Forget about Barnaby and Bayless, right? Seeing Christ perform these amazing miracles. And so you're just following him around. What miracle is he going to do now? Let's find someone who's ill. Let's find someone who's sick. What's, who's the sickest person we can find and see if Jesus can heal them? And so the crowds were following him. But Mark tells us, out of those crowds, some believed. Some believed. There were the friends of the paralytic man who brought him to Jesus and Jesus commended them for their faith. There was the woman with the internal bleeding, remember, who believed that if I just touch Jesus' cloak, I will be healed. And then Jesus felt power draining out of him. There was Jairus, the synagogue ruler, who came to Jesus because he believed Jesus could heal his daughter. And then when he heard news that his daughter had died, Jesus said, Do not fear, only believe. And he did, and Jesus healed his daughter. There was a Syrophenican woman who who asked Jesus to heal her daughter, even though she was miles away. And Jesus said that, that in this woman, he had not seen as much faith as in any in Israel. And then there was the blind man Bartimaeus, who despite the crowds around him, cried out, Jesus, son of David, Jesus, son of David. And call Jesus to himself. And it's interesting to note that all of these people are are kind of outsiders. They're people on the outside of Jewish society. And yet these are the people for whom Christ came to save. Remember what Paul said to the Corinthians? Not many of you were noble. Not many of you were wise by human standards. But God likes to perfect... God likes to... uh, what does he say? Uh, confound the wisdom of the wise of this world by saving those who the world considers kind of the dregs, as it were, of society. 
Then, besides these kind of people on the outside of Jewish society, there were Jesus' own disciples whom he chose to be with him, to follow him, whom he would give authority to go out and preach the gospel and to cast out demons. They believed Jesus, but they didn't fully comprehend everything about Christ. And they're quite interesting to, to read how Jesus interacted with his disciples because regularly he would reprove them. Remember the time he reproved them for not having faith when Jesus stilled the storm? Remember they were concerned that they were going to die and they were shaking Jesus? Jesus reproved them for not having insight when he walked on the water towards them after having just done this amazing miracle of creating bread and fish um, to feed 5,000 people. And then Jesus would often reprove them for their, their lack of understanding into his teaching. In fact, look with me in Mark chapter 8, verse 17 to 18. It's one of those incidences where Jesus is warning them about the, the leaven of the Pharisees and the leaven of Herod. And what he was meaning by that was he was meaning their influence, their teaching. But it had come off the back of the fact that Jesus had just fed, I think it was, 4,000 people. And so they're talking about the fact that, oh man, we didn't bring any bread. Jesus is hungry. We didn't bring any bread. And in verse 17, Jesus, aware of this, said to them, Why do you discuss the fact that you have no bread? Do you not yet see or understand? Do you have a hardened heart? Having eyes, do you not see? Having ears, do you not hear? And do you not remember when I broke the five loaves of the 5,000, how many baskets of, of broken pieces did you pick up? And he goes on from there. But again, he's reproving the disciples because they kind of saw, but they, they didn't really see. They kind of understood, but they didn't really understand. And then that's followed by this two-stage miracle of this blind man. Remember, this is the only time Jesus performed a miracle in two stages. Normally, he just did it instantly. So in this case he knew there was a reason for it and so Jesus heals this blind man in two stages and it's really kind of a, a parable on the commentary of his disciples in the first stage the man begins to see people's like trees walking around there's no real definition that he kind of gets the idea what's happening but there's no definitiveness to it and this really this this idea of this man's vision and this first healing is like the disciples spiritual vision it was kind of half formed they could kind of see, but they weren't seeing things clearly. And then Jesus then healed the man uh, on his second stage, and he could see them clearly. And so the disciples believed, but there was kind of uncertainty about it. Some people were then confused about Christ. Jesus' own family were confused about Christ. It says that they wanted to take him into custody because some thought that he had lost his senses. King Herod thought that Jesus was John the Baptist raised from the dead. He and other people thought that. Still others thought that Jesus was like a prophet of the Old Testament. And when you talk about, talk about Jesus with people today, who do they think Jesus is? Some of them say he's a good teacher. Some of them say he's just a man. I think I told you ages ago, I was working with an apprentice who didn't even think Jesus existed at all, which really showed his ignorance. But again, people will have their own ideas about who Jesus Christ is. And it's our responsibility as Christians for whoever we come into contact with and have the opportunity to talk to about is to bring them to a clear understanding. Maybe it's like the disciples. Maybe they, they, they kind of know and they kind of believe, but it's just a little bit blurry. And we want to just give them a 2020 vision on who Jesus is. So they might believe in him. And so besides those who believed, besides those who were confused, there was also those who were antagonistic towards Jesus. And you'll get this today with people. People who hate Christ, who, who hate Christianity. And this was primarily the religious and the political leaders, the, the scribes and the Pharisees, they objected to Jesus eating with sinners, whom he came to call to faith in him. The scribes accused him of being demon-possessed as a way of kind of explaining his miracles. 
Uh, the people of Jesus' hometown took offense at Jesus. And Jesus said, you know what? A prophet's not welcome in his hometown. The Pharisees argued with him. The chief priests, the scribes, the elders, the Pharisees, the Herodians, the whole lot, remember, tried to entrap Jesus. They sought to seize him by stealth and to kill him. And then finally, remember, Judas, one of Jesus' own disciples, who obviously did not, in the end, believe in Jesus, agreed to betray him, which then led to Jesus' arrest, to his trial, and to his crucifixion. But remember that Mark is at great pains to show us throughout his gospel that this, this wasn't just... Uh, this just, did done, this just didn't happen, right? This was called for in Scripture. God prophesied that this was in Scripture. Jesus said that this would happen, that he would be arrested, tried, delivered over to men, crucified, but on the third day rise again. That everything that happened to him was according to Scripture. And as I said, no doubt when you share the gospel with other people, you're going to get similar responses. In fact, you're probably even recalling in your mind now some of the different responses you've had with people as you've shared with them about who Jesus Christ is, as you've told them about why Jesus came, that they are sinners and Jesus came to call them to, to faith in him because he gave his life as a ransom for them. And so as you, you do this, you're probably wondering, well, some people just reject Christ. Some people are really antagonistic. Some people really hate it. Some people just need more talking to. Some people just blow it off. What, what, what's the reason for that? And, and how can I help them with that? Remember Mark, he explained the various responses that people had to Jesus when he told the parable of the soils. Do you remember that? So look at Mark chapter 4, verses 1 to 3. We're not going to read through the whole parable, but just as a summary, the seed represented the word of God, specifically the gospel, but then it could have been all of God's word. The sower represented the preacher. In this case, it was Jesus, but in your case, it's you sharing the gospel with other people. The soil represent the various hearers of the word. And Jesus presents four kinds of hearers. Right, four different kinds of reception to the gospel message. But the emphasis of the parable is on the hearers of the word. It's not on the word. It's not on the, the sharer or the preacher of the word, but it's on the hearers. And Jesus makes this really clear. The word here is the key word throughout this whole section. He uses it 13 times. When it comes to the actual parable, it has an inclusio in verse 3 and verse 9. It's this command to listen. It's a present tense. Listen. Keep on listening. Be careful how you listen when you're hearing the word of God. Listen. And Jesus speaks about those who are, have hardened hearts, and so they don't listen. There's people who have kind of temporary hearts. They love the things of this world. And so they soon abandon the word of God because they love the things of this world. You have those who, because of persecution, they abandon the word of God. They don't want to persevere in the truth because they don't want persecution that comes with believing and following the Lord Jesus Christ. But then you have those, those good hearts, those hearers that persevere to the end. They listen to the word of God and they keep listening, they keep believing, they keep repenting, and they keep following the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what he calls us to and, and that's what we're going to call other, to, other people to. And again, there's an importance that you communicate God's word, not your traditions, not your thoughts, not your commandments. Remember, Jesus reproved the religious leaders for doing that. That's what they taught the people, traditions of men. But Jesus came, kind of broke off the outer shell of men's tradition, pulled out the pure kernel of God's word and said, this is God's word, listen, here is the gospel. Follow me, trust me, believe in me, repent of your sins, and you will enter into the kingdom of heaven. And so it's incredibly important that when we communicate the word of God, we're communicating what God says. But it's equally important that we exhort people to listen carefully to the word of God, not just them, but us as well. 
because it is God's word. So when God's word is opened and it's read, God is what? Speaking. God is speaking. If you want to hear God speak, read his word. And so because God is speaking, we what? We listen. You may not like what you're hearing, but God is speaking. There's a relevance to you because God is speaking. And so we listen and we exhort people to do the same, to listen because it is God's word. And so when you're sharing the gospel with people, and maybe they're fidgety or maybe they're hostile or, or, or maybe they're just, you know, you're talking to your kids. Maybe your kids seem a little bit blasé about it and their eyes go glaze over. Exhort them to listen. Please listen. This is God's word. Take heed. It will save your life if you take heed and obey what God is saying. You want to pray for them and ask them to pray for understanding. Exhort them and encourage them to pray for a receptive heart to the word of God. And then to warn them of the consequences if they don't listen. Have you ever read through Proverbs, those first nine chapters? It's Solomon talking to his sons. And what does he say? Repeatedly, repeatedly. Listen, my son. Listen, my son. Accept the teachings of your father, the instructions of your mother. Listen, listen. Take wisdom. Grasp her. Lay hold of her. She will save you. And we're doing the same to people. We're exhorting them to listen to the word of God so they can know about Christ and believe in him because they will be saved. But this is a constant exhortation. Look with me in Hebrews chapter 2. Remember the, the people that that the writer of Hebrews is writing to, they're tempted to go back to Judaism. And, and as, as Sam was reading, it's amazing that Sam just did that. It's the second time this happened. But as Sam was, was reading, the, the writer was extolling the virtues of Christ over the sacrificial system. You can't go back to that because that never gave you permanent forgiveness of sins. It all pointed towards Christ. In Christ, you have forgiveness of sins permanently. And so throughout Hebrews, he's exhorting the, the excellency and the supremacy of Christ over and above the Jewish Old Testament uh, sacrificial system. And so in chapter 2, verse 1, he says, For this reason we must, we must pay much closer attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away from it. For if the word spoken through angels proved unalterable and every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty... How will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? After it was at first spoken through the Lord, it was confirmed to us by those who heard, God also testifying with them both by signs and wonders and by various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. Pay closer attention to the word of God. And then in Hebrews chapter 13, he says a very similar thing. He says, Take care, brethren, lest there be, lest there not be in any one of you an evil, unbelieving heart that falls away from the living God. But encourage one another day after day, as long as it is still called today, so that none of you will be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. For we have become partakers of Christ if we hold fast the beginning of our assurance firm until the end. And so there's this constant call to listen. Well, finally, we've seen who Jesus is. We've seen what he came to do. We saw how people responded to him. And finally, what is your response to Jesus? Having gone through the Gospel of Mark, what is your response to Jesus? Again, if you're not a believer, are you following Christ? You ought to follow Christ. You ought to repent of your sins and trust in him. He is the Savior of all mankind because you are a sinner and because God will hold you accountable for your sins. So you can either bear the penalty for your sin for all eternity or you can put your faith in Jesus Christ who has said that on that cross when he died, he bore the penalty for your sin in your place. And so put your faith in him. And then for those of you who are trusting in Christ, 
Are you actively following Christ today? Are you actively sharing the gospel with others? Praying and looking for opportunities, not just within the organized ministries of the church, but also in the communities where you live. And I'm preaching to myself as well. Are you constantly growing in his word and obeying it? Do you know more about Jesus this year than you did last year and the year before and before? Do you understand more of his salvation plan this year than you did last year and the year before? You want to be growing in in knowing Christ and knowing his word. So are you obeying his word constantly? I fear sometimes that, and I've seen it happen in churches, that Christians, because they're Christians, they then automatically think that their thinking and their desires are just in line with God's word. I, I warn you, that's just not true. It's just not true. Because we are called to constantly in the scriptures to have our minds renewed through the word of God. To examine ourselves by the word of God. To make sure that what we're thinking is biblical. 2 Timothy 3, 16, 17, remember says, For the word of God, for all scriptures inspired by God and profitable for teaching and reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be equipped for every good work. And that's true for all of us. How do we grow in sharing the gospel? How do we grow in counseling one another and helping one another? It's through the word of God. And so we are constantly growing and learning. The Apostle Peter calls us to put aside sin and to long for the pure milk of the word so that by it we may grow in respects to salvation. There's no point in the Christian life where we should become stagnant. We never know everything, right? Who here knows everything in the word of God? I know no one's going to put their hand out. But we're always wanting to know more of Christ. We, we want our hearts enlarged that we would love him more affectionately. Right? We want our stamina increased so that we may serve Christ more to the very end, till we breathe our last. We want to give our all for Christ. And so following Jesus means constantly listening to his word, repenting of any sin that he reveals in your life and trusting in him, trusting that he has forgiven that sin, but trusting in him and obeying in him, obeying him when he calls you to follow him in whatever area of life that may be. So finally, Mark ends his gospel with the resurrection of Christ, which means that Jesus is coming again. Amen? Jesus is coming again, and he's coming to bring salvation to those who trust him, but also he's coming to bring judgment on those who do not. And this is what you want to warn people about when you're sharing with them the gospel. In Mark 13, in verse 24, Jesus says, But in those days after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers that are in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory, and then he will send forth the angels and will gather together his elect from the four winds, from the furthest end of the earth to the furthest end of heaven. And then in First Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians, sorry. Chapter one and verse six. It says, Therefore, after all, it is only just for God to repay with affliction those who afflict you, and to give relief to you who are afflicted, and to us as well, when the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels and flaming fire dealing out retribution to those who do not know God and to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. And these will pay the penalty of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power when he comes to be glorified in the saints on that day and to be marveled at among all who have believed for our testimony to you is believed. And so Christ is coming again and he will come and he will establish his kingdom on the earth and he will recompense those who do not believe in him with judgment but those who have believed in him with great reward they will be a part of his kingdom and so as we go out this morning we want to learn the lesson from Mark to 
tell people about who Christ is, what he came to do, how they ought to respond to the Lord Jesus Christ, encouraging them and exhorting them with promises of blessing and warnings of judgment, as the Lord does. And that we ourselves, too, we want to remain steadfast, knowing that a great reward awaits us when Christ comes again to persevere to the end. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we do thank you for your word. We just thank you for its truth. We thank you for its objectivity. We thank you for its its graciousness to call sinners like us to faith in Jesus Christ. Father, thank you for your grace given us that we have repented of our sins and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, we pray that we would be faithful in following Christ. We think of all those who have gone before us. Father, we think of the saints in the Ukraine who are following Christ in the midst of war. Father, we think of other believers who are following Christ in the midst of persecution, some uh, resulting even in death. And Father, we pray for grace and strength and endurance to follow Christ today in the midst of the trials and the, uh, and the things that we may face. And amidst all of that, Lord, the grace to share the gospel with others, to tell others to follow Christ as we do, to put their hope and faith in the Savior who came into this world to redeem sinners from their sin and to reconcile them, Heavenly Father, to you. And so we thank you for this treasure that you've given to us within. And Lord, may we be so bold as to proclaim it. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen.